everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with Fullscript and Dr. Gio Espinoza. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day today to attend this uh, webinar with us. We're super excited to have Dr. Espinoza here with us. Uh, a little housekeeping before we get into everything. I just want to let everyone know that everyone who registered for the webinar will get access to the recording after the event, so um, keep an eye on your email for that. You can also find all of our webinars on fullscript.com slash webinars. So you'll be able to find um, find the recording there as well. If uh, um, you saw, you know, it gets lost in your spam or something as well, check there, but always can go back to the website. Um, so before we get really into it, if you don't know about um, Dr. Gio Espinosa, let me, let me fill you in. He is a naturopathic functional medicine doctor, um, recognized as an authority in neurology and men's health. He's a faculty and holistic clinician in urology at New York University, Langone Health. I may have pronounced things wrong here. I'll apologize in advance. And faculty for the Institute of Functional Medicine. Um, as an avid researcher and writer, he has authored numerous scientific papers and books, including a best-selling prostate cancer book, Thrive, Don't Only Survive. He is the chief medical officer and formulator at the male Focus nutraceutical company, XY Wellness. And he is the co-founder and writer of the popular mail health website, drgeo.com. Um, so we're, again, we're very excited to have um, Dr. Espinosa here with us today to speak about male hormones and health. And um, we will have, uh, we'll see how much time we have. There may be a little time at the end for questions. If not, we'll, we'll see how we can pass um, any questions along and get back to our attendees um, in the follow-up. So with all that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Espinoza and um, right. we'll kick it off and I'll disappear for a little bit. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Kayla. This is, uh, let me get my screen back up here. View slideshow. All right. All right, well, thanks so much for, um, it seems like there's a, quite a few of you that are attending and I'm sure you're in the middle of your busy day. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, uh, just a little bit of a background here. Um, you know, the molecule of testosterone, well, there's three things that I'm super interested in from a career and a professional perspective. There are three things that absolutely fascinate me. And the three, those three things are um, things that women don't have. So anything related to the prostate fascinates me. Anything related to like penile function and penile health fascinates me. Everything related to testosterone fascinates me. And I'm super curious about these three things. Of course, you're listening and you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. T testosterone, w women also have testosterone. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, women do have testosterone, except that men have a 20 to 30 times more testosterone in their bodies than women do. So these, these three things I'm, I'm super curious about, super passionate about, super, um, and, and I spent a great deal of my time, both clinically and um, in research, uh, looking at these three things and trying to um, do what I can to help men, to help men live longer and better <laughs> is the bottom line. So uh, that is that. Um, uh, the other thing is that I'm sure that there are non-clinicians uh, uh, listening to this uh, presentation which is perfectly fine by me. Um, some of these things may be over your head, so uh, just I'll tell you in advance, but uh, for those non-clinicians, enjoy, uh, enjoy the show, if you will. Um, uh, but my, my focus today is on really helping clinicians figure this thing out with, um, with testosterone and male hormones and what to do clinically. Of course, I... <laughs> I really only have about 45 minutes to do all this, which, you know, I could give a, a, a whole week lecture uh, on, on male hormones. So I want to try to condense it, leave you hopefully uh, less confused about male hormones uh, than uh, you first started, and hopefully give you some, um, some tools that you can uh, use in your clinical practice. Um, I will be having some sort of um, numerous courses um, that I'm developing uh, online. So all, if you'd like to be in touch with me or stay in touch with me, drgeo.com, drgeo.com is the way to do that. Okay, so let's get, let's get started here. All right, um, 
uh, disclosure, I am chief medical officer and co-founder of XY Wellness, uh, which, um, you know, Fullscript is a partner of ours. So I want to thank Fullscript and everyone involved and Cam, uh, Cam Moore too, for helping me with this presentation. All right, testosterone. So <laughs> the only difference between a estro estrogen molecule and testosterone is only one thing, right? So this methyl group here, and I, maybe you can see my arrow, my cursor, this methyl group doesn't exist in estrogen and uh, estradiol. So this is a, a double bond uh, molecule here in estrogen. The attachment of this methyl group on the fourth carbon ring makes testosterone, testosterone, and estrogen, estrogen. I find that absolutely remarkable. Uh, absolutely remarkable that <laughs> these two molecules uh, have such a significant impact in the in the body, and uh, too much of one and less of the other uh, can change everything about how we are in health, how we feel. And the only difference here is this one methyl molecule on testosterone. So anyway, these are the kinds of things that I <laughs> that I find interesting and curious. All right. Um, I'm hoping that you learned several things today. I hope, I'm hoping that you learn about the um, the uh, hypothalamus uh, pituitary gonadal axis and what um, how that affects um, testosterone in men. Uh, diseases associated with hypogonadism, some of the causes, some ideas of how to not diagnose hypogonadism, and other hormones that are important in male longevity and optimal for for male longevity and optimal functioning. The other thing is, you know, how to treat hypogonadism uh, clinically. Um, you know, what are the steps that I uh, uh, that I use to, uh, to to treat men with low testosterone, um, and do I do I even treat all men <laughs> that have low testosterone? So we'll talk about that. Uh, so there's some key structures here. So a healthy, a healthy functioning um, a hypo, a hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis is very important. Then there's a feedback system that occurs there. Um, uh, these key enzymes uh, have to be have to behave properly. So there's numerous enzymes throughout the whole process from the hypothalamus to the pituitary and um, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone to then um, uh, the pituitary gland releasing FSH and LH, and then that uh, LH um, uh, stimulating the uh, androgen receptors of the testicles to release the testosterone. So it's a huge process that occurs there. Um, so management, uh, so the other component of healthy, normal testosterone is SHBG, right? So as you know, uh, testosterone as is estrogen and cortisol and all these lipid soluble uh, steroids are lipid soluble, they're, they're, they're hydrophobic. So um, um, you're, it's required for the transport of these hormones, just, um, something else is required to transport them. So that's SHBG. Uh, the other component that's very important is your latex cells, right? So these are the cells in the testicle, test, testicles that have to function correctly. You need enough of them and you need them to function correctly in order to make enough testosterone. As a man ages, there's two things that seems to happen. There are less latex cells produced, and or these latex cells do not function correctly. Uh, and one last thing is the androgen receptors. Again, you need enough androgen receptors and you need them to function correctly. Testosterone molecule needs to fit like a, like a, like a lock and key into that process. All right, so here, here are some quick facts about testosterone. Um, it's a steroid hormone that cannot be stored in cells that produce it, right? So uh, none of the cells that produce testosterone is stored is quickly released into, into, into other cells and quickly transported. Uh, testosterone is produced uh, directly uh, by the nervous system and the hypothalamic, um, uh, when the hypothalamic area is, is uh, stimulated. Um, and there is a feedback inhibition system. So when there is enough um, testosterone in the system, it sends signals to the uh, uh, hypothalamus to stop making, um, eventually, testosterone. 
um, testosterone has an anti-catabolic effect uh, and through its inhibition of cortisol. So cortisol and testosterone are antagonists, meaning that too much cortisol in the body will stop the production of, uh, of, of testosterone being produced. The opposite is true. Uh, uh, a healthy amounts of testosterone inhibits um, overproduction of cortisol or any of the glucocorticoids uh, hormones. Um, and so again, it has an anti-catabolic effect. Testo um, so the half-life of testosterone is about 12 minutes. Um, it's, uh, it increases uh, uh, through, it increases or decreases based on, again, the negative feedback loop. Um, typically, the highest level of testosterone is in the morning, um, roughly between 6 and 8 a.m. in the morning. That's where it's um, oftentimes best to uh, draw blood uh, to check for testosterone at um, sometime in the morning, let's say 8 a.m. That's typically the case in men, in younger men, let's say under the age of 60, 65. I think I have a slide later on that's going to show you that some data shows that, yep, in the morning is the best time to uh, draw blood and test for testosterone. In men, that's roughly around 60, 65. In older men, let's say over 60, 65, that doesn't really matter. The, uh, you can test it at any time because it doesn't seem to be just a, a, a significant production of testosterone in men over the age of 60 or 65. Um, actually, there, there won't be much of a, of a history other than this. Um, I felt recently, <laughs> recently I felt like my son when he gets a, an Amazon gift, right? So he gets a toy from Amazon, he opens up uh, the box and it's a toy um, and he's very excited. Uh, I recently ordered uh, the very first book, an original book on testosterone, the first book ever written in 1945 by this microbiologist <laughs> called Paul de, Gru de Cruyff. Um, again, he's a microbiologist, really just with keen interest at the time in the, the male hormone, testosterone. Um, in the early 40s is the advent of testosterone in terms of it being studied, it being looked at, it being looked at scientifically, it being looked at for uh, treatment, uh, medical treatment for particularly hypogonadal kids, hypogonadal um, young men. Uh, uh, so. This is the very first book ever written on it. So I, I got this book recently and it was, the, <laughs> these are the things that actually excite me quite a bit. Okay, so clinical laboratory tests, uh, total testosterone, anything under 300 is considered hypogonadal. So um, that's that, anything, any bio, bioavailable testosterone, anything under 17, uh, sorry, 70, nanograms per milliliter is considered hypogonadal as well. And then pre-testosterone is anything under 50 picograms per milliliter. Again, these are all standard ranges, uh, not ranges, um, uh, lower limits with regards to testosterone. Somebody could be have a total testosterone of 350, but still have symptoms, still have hypogonadal symptoms. Um, bioavailable testosterone, is testosterone that is also attached to albumin. So it's not attached to SHBG, but also attached to albumin. Free testosterone is exactly that. It's not attached to anything. And uh, it's not attached to albumin or SHBG. Some of the screening tools that are used are the ATOM questionnaire, androgen def deficiency in aging male. That's the questionnaire that I think is most popular that um, we use clinically and the one that, um, uh, I suggested uh, um, I suggested uh, functional uh, Institute of functional medicine to have it's a very is a, is a good tool to use um, to with certain questions that kind of can indicate if uh, the patient is uh, hypogonadal all right so what's in a name uh, andropause so you have um, you have man uh, what's the term that you use uh, 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 
you have andropause, you have hypogonadism, and so forth. You know, andropause is sort of like a name that was used to and developed to kind of correspond to women's uh, menopause. But um, how it works is completely different, both in men and, and in women. Women at a certain age, they just stop producing, you know, enough estrogen and things like that. Men could have low testosterone in their 20s, which I see clinically all the time. So the, the, the more proper and I guess medical and scientific term that we use is hypogonadism. So um, that's the word that we'll continue to use throughout this presentation. Okay, so we have primary and secondary hypogonadism. Primary hypogonadism is a man with low testosterone but has normal levels of LH and FSH. That indicates that the problem source, if there is normal levels of S, uh, L, LH and FSH but low levels of testosterone, the primary cause is testicular. Something is going on in the testicles. Again, they could be not enough latex cells or not enough healthy latex cells or uh, not enough uh, androgen receptors or not enough androgen receptors in the latex cells that are healthy enough, whatever. But it, the source of the problem is in uh, uh, the testicular. Uh, uh, problem. Of course, there's some natural things that occur, like Klein, uh, a genetic disorder called Kleinfelter syndrome, um, or mumps, or anyone in chemotherapy and things like that, that can cause. Um, but for most men that you'll see that do not have any of these conditions or history of these conditions, um, that's still the primary cause of it, unless, again, there's um, low levels of FSH and LH. Secondary hypogonadism is men with low testosterone, but also have um, decreased levels of LH and FSH. So typically that's a hypo hypothalamic failure. That's a hypothalamic problem or a pituitary problem. So that's why when, um, when drawing blood to test for testosterone, you want to do a panel of FSH, LH as well um, to identify the, the cause. Um, uh, pro, if, if there is a decrease both in FSH and LH, you also want to test, uh, you want to test pro, for prolactin. So an increased level of prolactin in men um, can, can imply that there is a, uh, a pituitary tumor. Uh, which then you would, of course, um, send off to uh, get a scan, a CT scan, uh, to determine um, uh, if there's indeed a tumor or an MRI to determine if there's a tumor uh, in the hypothal hypothalamic pituitary area. All right, so up to 89% of, of hypogonadism um, uh, does not... <laughs> Uh, uh, does not fit into the classical scheme of things. So yes, 11% is either related to genetics or um, some medications or chemotherapy or uh, tumors in a, in a hypothalamic area or something of the sorts. But about 89% of men with hypogonadism is, well, I, I don't know. I don't know what's causing it. I think that um, part of the 80%, 89% is for sure is the lifestyle. These are men, on, for example, men with met obese people, obese men tend to have a lower testosterone as an example. Um, uh, metabolic syndrome. I, I would say that um, if to treat most urological conditions, this is, you know, BPH, uh, enlargement of the prostate, um, erectile dysfunction, um, kidney stones, uh, 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 prostatitis, um, so prostate cancer. Uh, mo if you if you address metabolic syndrome, um, that's the first thing to do. Uh, uh, so I would think that eighty nine some of the eighty nine percent has to do with obesity and me metabolic syndrome. All right. All right, so what does this molecule called testosterone, what does it do to the body? So testosterone affects in the body. So libido and memory. So uh, what I was saying before my computer just shut down was um, that I have, uh, I hate to say great fortune because it's not such a great thing, but I do see men um, with zero testosterone because I've treated for advanced prostate cancer. And one of the treatments for advanced prostate cancer is uh, chemical castration. And then I see men who 
on anabolic steroids because they're bodybuilders. So I see, and that's not my, I don't prescribe it to them. They're already on it. So they come to see me because they're, you know, their testicles have decreased in size and have other issues. Um, so I see testosterone from zero to even 3000 in men <laughs> and everything in between. So I've seen the, it's, it's nice to see that uh, what, what you learn in medical books that, you know, you see it in, you see it clinically. Um, anyway. So uh, the other thing it does is it has an anabolic effect. So typically men want to, on to uh, need testosterone to have more muscles, even if muscles are not, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger um, in terms of defined, but more men have more musculature uh, typically with higher testosterone. It stimulates the production of erythropoietin. Um, I don't want to go through the whole list. You can all read it. Um, supports collagen formation. Uh, um, and and is a and, and very important component of sexual uh, sexual component for men with regards to penile growth, the erectile function, prostate uh, production of sperm, sperm, etc. All right. Um, so again, this is just we so the. The uh, hypothalamus uh, produces uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Then that stimulates the production of FSH and LH in the pituitary gland. From there, there's a signal that goes into the uh, testicles of, of men. Um, um, the one responsible for the production of testosterone is the latex cells, um, and the stimulation there is from um, only from. Uh, from LH, luteinizing hormone. FSH stimulates the production of sperm and, and spermatogenesis. Um, the, um, from there on, uh, the latex cells produce testosterone. Of course, this is in a healthy, normal male, and many things happen after testosterone is produced that we'll go over in a second. Oh, yeah. I forgot that I had all these uh, fancy slides here. All right, here we go. Transport of testosterone. So as you know, testosterone is hydrophobic and has to bind to a protein. That protein is sex hormone binding globulin, globulin, <laughs> SHBG, um, which binds to um, uh, at least half, if not uh, a good portion of testosterone. Uh, the remaining testosterone in the body is, is attached to albumin or just roaming free. Uh, in order for testosterone to work uh, uh, effectively, um, it needs to be free. Only free testosterone does the things that you want, all the healthy things that we've just learned uh, from the previous slide, uh, only comes from free testosterone. Uh, and in free form, we really have only, uh, about 0.2 to 2% of total testosterone is free form, uh, which is a very good thing because not, um, everything in the body, as you know, is about checks, checks and balances. So too much of a good thing is not such a great thing. Um, SHBG reduces the movement of testosterone from the blood into other uh, bio compartments. So uh, SHBG seems to bind to testosterone very strongly. So one of the things we would want to do in some cases where the SHBG is way too high, if the goal is to free up testosterone, we want to lower um, SHBG, which um, some botanicals can help actually help us with. Free testosterone is, um, well, is the fraction of the total testosterone that is available. Um, uh, we went through some of this. Higher total testosterone, lower SHBG can affect, in, ha, have an effect in increased free testosterone. Um, the European Male Aging Society uh, study um, that looked at 3,000 men showed that lower free testosterone symptoms were associated with increase or a decrease in sexual thoughts, weak morning erections, and erectile dysfunction. So again, this is, and the reason why this is important is because sometimes you have, sometimes you have high, uh, high total testosterone, but uh, lower free testosterone or abnormal um, or lo low, end, low end of the range free testosterone. And you will see men have, so let's say a man will present with a testosterone of 520, but their free testosterone is uh, on the low end. Uh, that means there's too much SHBG or too much binding of SHBG, for example. Sometimes you have men with low testosterone, roughly, let's say anywhere, uh, I'm just pulling numbers out of the air. Um, let's say you have a man with 
the testosterone 380. So remember the lower end is 300, um, but they have a good amount of free testosterone and they're asymptomatic. That's just an incidental finding. They don't have any hypogonadal symptoms. So it ranges. Um, um, but if they do complain about sexual uh, lack of sexual thoughts, weak lack of or weak morning erections or, or erectile dysfunction, that may be a, a uh, low that may be a result of low levels of free testosterone. All right, the Leydig cells. Um, the bigger um, the bigger the patient, the um, less effective uh, the Leydig cells, and the le the lesser the number of Leydig cells Leydig cells that are produced. Um, stress has a negative effect on uh, the health of Leydig cells. And zinc deficiencies are um, can uh, is correlated with um, either uh, Leydig cells that don't function properly or, or lower numbers of, of Leydig cells. Okay, so zinc is a very important component to uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. Androgen receptors uh, found in the prostate, in the adrenal glands, in the skeletal muscles, in the liver, and the central nervous system. Uh, Testosterone um, binds. Uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, testosterone binds. Uh, we, yeah. So testosterone, <laughs> testosterone um, has a, a weak bonding effect to, um, to estrogen receptors. Um, um, DHT, however, has a significant binding effect to eat. So DHT is about 10 times more powerful than testosterone in terms of, in terms of its binding effect to testosterone. Um, so that's that. Uh, uh, the, last, the last point here, DHT binds to androgen receptors two times more potentially than testosterone. It actually has a much bigger effect than just two times more, actually. Uh, DHT, uh, which is, um, so DHT is dihydrotestosterone, right? So that's a metabolite from testosterone. And um, there's a lot of receptors, uh, androgen receptors around the prostate. So DHT can... Uh, make the prostate uh, enlarged and and so and, and grow. Um, oftentimes, the prostate doesn't necessarily. So, an enlarged prostate doesn't necessarily induce urinary symptoms. That's very important. So, an enlarged prostate does not induce urinary symptoms often, but sometimes it does. And and that's so what are the treatments? It's uh, dutasteride or finasteride to reduce uh, the production of DHT in that situation. But that's a different story for a different day. So physical diagnosis, you see, you'll see um, uh, in men with hypogonadism. So part of the physical exam is an enlarged breast. Sort of um, uh, uh, it, uh, lack of distribution of body hair. So you look at, you know, you would look at their pubic hairs, and sometimes there's not a lot of pubic hair. Sometimes it's kind of scattered around, um, or just a lack of body hair altogether. Um, uh, the size of the testicles may be small, smaller than normal, uh, and the size of the penis may be smaller than normal. Now, as a male doctor, <laughs> most men. <laughs> Most men think they have a small penis, so um, it's hard if you you don't have context. It's hard to determine if they are uh, they have a, a small penis or not. Um, but testicular uh, size, um, there's a way of determining that. There's a tool out there that is called orchidectomy, uh, not orchidectomy, uh, orchid uh, uh, orchidectomy, uh, and we're going to talk about that on the next slide. Anyway, part of the physical examination is looking at all these things. And 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 seeing, um, you know, as part of the physical exam. Um, so this is, um, yeah, anybody who's been um, treat doing hormones or treating hormones for any amount of time know this slide uh, very well. This is the diagram of how the body um, creates. Uh, steroid hormones. Um, it always starts with cholesterol, of course. So cholesterol being an important component, and this is why I do not reduce the cholesterol in most of my patients, um, because cholesterol is very important for the production of testosterone, for example. Um, of course, if they're uh, all things being equal, um, 
I have seen, for example, men on high high amounts of, te, of uh, statin drugs who also are hypogonadal. Uh, of course, that's correlation uh, more than causation, but it might be causation. I don't know. I see. I have seen clinically a direct correlation with high um, with statin drugs and uh, the use of statin drugs and low testosterone. Um, what do I want to say about this slide? Oh, as you can see, it's um, so testosterone does many things. I'm going to focus on testosterone here that's created from uh, all these other molecules. Um, it either is converted to estradiol um, from uh, the aromatase uh, enzyme or the 5-alpha reductase enzyme converts it to DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which we said it may, ha it may cause, uh, DHT may cause uh, an enlargement of the prostate. Uh, DHT uh, um, or testosterone has its own effect, actually. Uh, testosterone attaches to androgen receptors and it has its own effect. So one of three things typically happen. Either, either it does its own thing, it converts to estradiol, or it converts to uh, dihydrotestosterone. And of course, all these things need to be balanced. Too much conversion to estradiol, that causes feminization in men and causes a decrease in testosterone. Too much um, DHT, that can cause an enlarged prostate. And by the way, too much estradiol in men can also cause a, a, an enlarged prostate as well. And um, some studies have um, indicated that it's actually not, es not DHT, but estradiol that causes uh, the prostate to grow. I think it's both actually. Uh, so that's that. Um, Androstenedione and, uh, and uh, androstenediol um, are not available. So it used to be uh, up until 2004 that these, these substances were available over the counter, just like DHEA is. As you know, DHEA is available over the counter as a supplement. Androstene Dion and Androstene Dial were as well. After 2004, because of the scandal with baseball players like Mark McGuire, who apparently was using, and was using Androstene Dion and Androstene Dial uh, for, um, for enhancement, uh, of his uh, for performance and enhancement, um, um, it was banned in 2004, and now it's only used for pre uh, prescriptive. But I'm not sure that anybody, I'm not sure of any clinicians that use endocrine dial or dial um, clinically. Um, so, uh, morning. So initial screening is morning morning testosterone levels are highest in the morning. Normal is generally between 3,000 and 1,000. Um, I th think you, you're gonna wanna know, okay, what's the optimal uh, testosterone for men? Um, there's no clear optimal testosterone for men in terms of numbers. I do think roughly around 600 is a very good number for most men. 600 testosterone typically leads to enough free testosterone and not, not too much estradiol or DHT, roughly 600, 700. I think that too much testosterone higher than in, in a thousands or higher than a thousand uh, can, first of all, is a distraction um, in many ways. Um, um, uh, testosterone affects personality and moods. So while very being hypogonadal, this men are, tend to be more irritable. When men have too much testosterone, they tend to be irritable as well. So you, you don't want too much of it. Um, you always want to confirm testosterone in the morning after uh, particularly if it's too low or too high. And do not, do not take a blood test, uh, blood draw for testosterone. It is an illness of any kind. Um, well, malnutrition or any kind of illness. Um, certain medications actually lowers testosterone. Opioids, for example, lower testosterone. Um, statins lower testosterone. So that needs to be taken into account. Some of the medical history that's important is when they reach puberty um, and sexual development. Um, uh, any illnesses, uh, past or present, nutritional deficiencies. Um, zinc, again, is a very important component to, uh, I would say zinc. Uh, I, I don't know, so if you were to ask me, okay, which is the most important mineral for, for men? I, I don't know what the answer is, because I think magnesium is very important for overall health, as, as you know, but zinc is it's up there in terms of 
uh, testicular health, prostate health. I think zinc is a very important uh, uh, mineral. Anyway, uh, uh, any sexual problems or history of sexual problems or a molestation of any kind, life events, all these things as an important part of the medical history. Um, uh, testicular problem, history of testicular cancer. Um, sometimes men have, uh, men with a history of testicular cancer, for example, probably had um, an orchiectomy uh, and had the removal of one testicle. Uh, in men like that, they can still have normal, high, normal testosterone levels um, or within range. So, with the use, with, with the um, with the avail, with the other available testicle, so that the other testicle can produce a decent amount of testosterone where they're not hypogonadal. Uh, so you can they live just fine, and sometimes they're able to uh, conceive and have children. Uh, the physical exam, we talked about some of this already. So orchidometer is what I was trying to say earlier. So there's an orchidometer that you can actually purchase if you don't know what a normal testosterone is. So orchidometer, um, they are in a scale of one to, uh, to 25. And so this is adults typically are six, eight or 10. So how do you get an orchidometer? How do you get your hands on one of these? Uh, you go on Amazon and you find them actually. <laughs> it's pretty easy to find. Um, so uh, roughly, uh, actually men, uh, a normal size test, um, testicle is about 20 to 25 in one of these orchidometers. Um, so uh, you can easily find on Amazon. I think it's, oh, I don't know what the price is lately. I don't use these anymore. I, <laughs> I palpate so many uh, male pelvic uh, areas that uh, at this point I pretty much know what I'm looking for. Um, circadian testosterone, so for testosterone secretion. So um, as I mentioned earlier, young men is very important to get their testosterone levels as early as possible, but it matters a little bit less in older men. This is men over 60 or 65 where their, their production of testosterone is pretty steady throughout the, throughout the day and not so high in, in the morning like it is, to, with, uh, like it is with younger men. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, prevalence, it's about 10% of men in their 40s and 25% of men in their, in their 70s are hypogonadal. Um, I see a lot of men uh, in, um, in their 30s that are hypogonadal. I think that um, there's been a, a surge of hypogonadal men throughout the last 20 years uh, for many reasons. Some of that has to do with stress, perhaps. Some of that has to do with um, of, uh, um, xenoestrogen, so estrogenic compounds that we are exposed to through our pl plastics and things like that. Um, uh, so uh, I think it might be more than that. Uh, low onset hypogonadism increases with age, um, right, at, right around 30 years old, all things considered. Um, so that's that. Um, signs and symptoms. Again, the number one sign and symptom of men with hypogonadism is lack of libido or sexual issues or doesn't don't get erections or erectile dysfunction or things like that. That's the, that is the first and number one complaint. So we're going to talk about that um, later on in terms of some ideas of what to do with these men, what to do with these men with the uh, with ED. Um, Gynecomastia, you see sometimes, not all the time. Um, a decrease of spontaneous erections occur really with almost every man after a certain age. Hot flashes and sweats, typically you don't see that, um, but you do see that in some men. You certainly see that in men who are in androgen deprivation therapy for advanced prostate cancer, but you don't see it much in men um, without uh, that, that are not being treated for advanced prostate cancer, uh, although I've seen it a few times. but. Typically, again, the main symptom is um, low libido, lack of sexual uh, abilities, if you will. Uh, they complain about memory, anemia, you know, the, uh, memory or sleep disturbances and things of the sort. Of the sort. Um, so, all right. So, what do you do? Um, the workup is check T levels in the morning. Uh, get it uh, at least twice within three weeks. Check for FSH and LH. Um, and so, as you know, primary hypogonadism is a result of, uh, of normal FSH and LH, but low T. Um, 
and check for prolactin levels if uh, if uh, if um, the levels are low and check for prolactinemia, which then you would have to refer to get them checked out for uh, a brain tumor. Um, so, so why would you care to help men? So let's just say uh, you, a man presents, comes for something else, anything else, and you find out they have low testosterone because you test as an incidental finding. Should you treat low testosterone? And that is the million dollar question. Should you treat low testosterone in men that are asymptomatic? Well, it might be the case uh, because um, men who are hypogonadal are at about fivefold risk of mortality from all causes. Um, so men with that are hypogonadal tend to be at higher risk of dying from anything, um, uh, including and especially uh, from uh, cardiovascular disease. So it, all things considered, so sometimes men that are hypogonadal are also metabolic syndrome and other things. So I think once again, once you fix the overall uh, component, if you treat the, you know, like the integrative and naturopathic and functional medicine philosophy, treat the person, not the numbers, not the disease. I think if you do that, they'll do very well. Uh, so some of these medications are associated with low testosterone. So decrease of latex cell production um, are induced by corticosteroids and keto, uh, ketoconazole. Um, other, so uh, 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 cimetidine, uh, which is used, as you know, for uh, for acid reflux, um, very commonly used drug that can bind to androgen receptors and therefore cause hypogonadism. So oftentimes it's in the medications. Um, a corticosteroids, um, excess alcohol consumption uh, can cause hypogonadism. Uh, finasteride decreases the conversion of testosterone to DHT, and that's a medication that's used for, for that purpose. Um, oftentimes, it it's also uh, comes with certain secondary symptoms and gynec uh, gynecomastia and sexual problems. So that's a drug that I try to limit um, in my patients from, from taking finasteride and dutasteride. Uh, that's um, Proscar and Avidar. Those are the trade names. Um, as mentioned earlier, statins can, is associated with um, lowering testosterone. Um, I think that if they need to, if they need to lower their, if they need to use a statin, uh, 10 milligrams a day for most of these statins is fine. Much higher than that, then you really start um, lowering testosterone levels. So, um, but uh, a patient that I had just this morning with a testosterone, uh, I'm sorry, for with a total cholesterol of 245, I had no intentions of him using a statin for that purpose, uh, particularly when his ratio of tes total testosterone to HDL was 3.1, which is pretty good. So his HDL was pretty high. Anyway, um, um, and I'm only mentioning this because this was, it was urged by his primary care and kind of, um, but to, to take a statin, I don't agree with that. All right, progesterone in men. So the androgen receptor is very much uh, uh, related to the progesterone receptor. So progestins, um, all sorts, uh, all types of progesterone progestins have a uh, can block androgen receptor. So you want to. Um, check for progesterone as well. Sometimes progesterone can be very high, and again, it blocks the androgen receptor. Um, so decreased levels of progesterone um, are associated with increased levels of, of estradiol, uh, which stimulates uh, conversion from estradiol to estrone, and which is three to 10 times less potent. So measure progesterone as well. Um, and I, I don't normally measure it initially, but I read, if my patient is still with low testosterone, um, then as a follow-up panel, I do include progesterone. I just won't, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, you can order it initially. I just tend not to because many times progesterone is the, not the issue I find clinically. So estrogen to testosterone ratio. So as you know, testosterone is converted to estradiol by a, a, the enzyme aromatase. Uh, as men age, the ratio of estradiol to testosterone increases. So it's not only about the number, the absolute value of testosterone. It's about the ratio between estradiol and testosterone. 
that's very important. So you can have, so always look at that ratio. Um, elevated est estradiol testosterone rate, uh, ratio increases the risk of many things, including BPH and uh, prostate cancer. Uh, so again, it's not only the decline of testosterone, but also the increase of estradiol that causes all this, all these symptoms uh, in, hypo, in, hypo, uh, in a man who's hypogonadal. So what's a good ratio? A good ratio is roughly um, 20 to 30 to 1, I would say about 20 to 30 to 1 testosterone to estrogen. Um, that's, a, that's a very good ratio, I, I think. Uh, but the other thing is that um, don't lo lower test lower estrogen it's uh, so so there's some practitioners that i find that um, they just want to lower estrogen to make it as close as possible to zero um in men and i think that's not a good idea um this particular study by jama showed that um the best the best range for men with regards to to estrogen is between 20 to 30 picograms per milliliter. So I typically like my patients to be between 20 to 30 picograms per milliliter in estrogen. Why? Because estrogen, estrogen, estradiol does serve a purpose in men uh, with regards to heart disease and osteosporosis and a few other things. So cardiovascularly and and uh, uh, with regards to bone health and things like that, we uh, men also need estrogen. So I don't want them to be too close to zero. I like the range to be roughly between 20 and 30 picograms per milliliter. And as long as the ratio is somewhere between 20 to 30 um, to one um, testosterone to estrogen. Um, so SHBG is produced by the liver where it regulates the bioavailability, uh, bioavailability, <laughs> bioavailability of, of sex uh, steroids like testosterone. Um, SHBG is decreased by androgens and advanced aging and hypothyroidism. So there again, um, the thyroid has a, an effect on the rest of the body, including an endocrinological effect as it relates to testosterone. Um, patients with liver disease tend to have abnormal uh, levels of SHBG because that's where it's, SHBG is produced. Um, SHBG tends to be lower in obese men. Um, that could be for many reasons. So it's, that could be because less is required at, from a testosterone perspective, because men that are obese typically have lower testosterone levels, uh, or because they have higher insulin concentrations uh, uh, from metabolic syndrome, and that affects the production of SHBG. Uh, um, those are the main things. Uh, again, you could read those bullet points that are essential. I'm just I don't want to run out of time. Make sure that I want to see if we can answer questions towards the end. So what increases H SHBG, aging, hyperthyroidism, liver disease, HIV, and anti-convulsants medications? And what decreases SHBG? Obesity, insulin resistance, hypothyroidism, androgens, progestin, um, uh, nephrotic syndrome. That's a kidney disorder. All right, the zillion dollar question. Testosterone as it relates to prostate cancer. Should I decrease my testosterone as a, because I heard you, you you've all kind of told me in many different <laughs> in different forms that testosterone is associated with prostate cancer. So here's the story. As best as I know it, this changes the research changes within time. Um, but here here's what we have. Um, so a high incidence of aggressive prostate cancer have been noticed in men with low T, not high T. And I've seen this clinically where low T uh, has been associated with, uh, with, high, uh, with high prostate cancer, high advanced prostate cancer. Uh, so again, uh, in, in this, uh, the, the second study there by the BJU in 2011 shows the same thing. Analyzing recent grade high-risk disease was in, uh, including was associated with low testosterone after prostatectomy, not high testosterone. So that is that. <laughs> How about can we treat testosterone, can we treat men after prostate cancer with testosterone? It depends and depends. I tell you that um, if a man had test, if a man had prostate cancer, they had to, had it successfully treated with any modality, whether it's prostatectomy or uh, radiation, and they've never been on hormone therapy. That's a very important point. I would not treat a man who's been on 
androgen deprivation therapy with testosterone at any point. Only in men who've never been treated with ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, can po we possibly treat with testosterone or try to increase their testosterone levels if they are hypogonadal and they show symptoms. Sometimes men are on active surveillance for prostate cancer. That means that they aren't, uh, they don't need treatment. Um, if a man for, for about two years is successfully treated for prostate cancer, they have low risk pathology meaning there's lower risk of metastasis or spreading of prostate cancer, and or they're on active surveillance, and they're, they're showing symptoms for hypogonadism, those men can be treated carefully with testosterone as long as the um, testosterone level after they're treated, it's not above, let's say, 700 or so. So I would keep it around the 700 mark, more or less. And that's a pretty standard approach across the board amongst uh, urologists and endocrinologists. Um, if, if FSH and LH is low, one of the primary treatments initially is clomiphene citrate. Um, it's, this is an off-label use. So clomiphene has been very good and a very gentle way of increasing testosterone um, by stimulating the hypothalamus pit pit pituitary axis and causing an increase of FSH and LH. Uh, typically, the dosage is about 50 milligrams every other day. Clomiphene citrate is also a good approach with certain supplements for, male, for men on, um, with, with male infertility. Um, so it's been used successfully for that purpose as well. Um, if men have a, a, a estradiol level of more than 60 picograms per milliliter, I would not use clomiphene. Uh, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, all I want to say about this is that, um, so this is your finasteride and dutasteride. Um, it lowers D DHT, um, but in some, in some studies it shown that it might increase the risk of, of uh, a prostate cancer. Uh, but some of, that, some of those studies, studies have been debunked. So <laughs> what do you do? These are my least favorite drugs for men who are having urinary problems. So I would not necessarily, um, uh, there's other methods of treating men with urinary problems that are not associated with, uh, with, with, you know, uh, with BPH. Um, right, let's move on. So what do we do? From a natural perspective, from a natural perspective, um, it seems that too much licorice consumption, and again, I don't know who, who consumes so much licorice, but I think in some cultures they do, and they consume licorice in, in candy form or whatever. Um, this study showed that there was a significant uh, lower, lower testosterone in men with, with, uh, with, that consume a lot of licorice. Um, stinging nettle root. So remember the SHBG or too much, uh, SHBG is associated with um, lack of available free testosterone. So sticking, stinging nettle root, uretica dioca, root, not the leaf, the root, seem to have a very nice effect as a SHBG inhibitor, also as an aromatase inhibitor, but does not block androgen receptors. So, um, so stinging nettle root at a dosage about 500 milligrams, let's just say twice a day, seems to be um, effective roughly for this purpose. Um, tribulus. So tribulus is one of those um, botanicals that are constantly used for uh, to increase testosterone, um, but it doesn't seem to work. This seemed to have been studied mostly in animal models, um, showing some increase, but doesn't seem to work uh, clinically or in research for that particular purpose for, uh, for humans. So I do not use tribulus as a botanical for that purpose. Um, maca. Uh, maca may increase testosterone both in men and in women. Actually, the research sometimes show that the increase in testosterone is mainly in women, more than so than men. Um, 
um, but it but it does require high dosing about 1500 to 3000 milligrams a day so if there's a formula out there with maca but the dosage is very small part of a whole formula it may not work so when i do give maca to patients i give them maca um, at about 3000 milligrams a day icarin and epid epimedium seems to be a pd5 inhibitor um, it might increase testosterone in men. Certainly some animal studies have shown that and clinically I've seen the potential increase in testosterone in, in, in men. I've seen that clinically with the use of epimedium. Don't know exactly how uh, it does that. I don't know the mechanism, uh, but it might do so. Um, so it might be uh, a botanical, a good botanical that's used for uh, men that are hypogonadal also presenting with erectile dysfunction. Rhodiola uh, has not shown to necessarily to increase testosterone. It can increase uh, uh, energy and, and it reduced uh, risk of stress or fatigue from stress or mental fatigue uh, from stress, which is oftentimes a symptom of men that are hypogonadal. So um, rhodiola is an adaptogen and it's one of my favorite ones um, along with ashwagandha, I think. Um, so it's, it's, I, I think that if we, if, the, if for any patient that we may have with that's hypogonadal and has erectile dysfunction, I think using adaptogens is the right way to go. Ashwagandha uh, is one of my favorites, <laughs> actually. It seems to um, have a nice effect of, uh, of improving the testosterone to cortisol ratio. Um, also uh, normalizes other type of uh, hormones like prolactin and FSH, has other benefits and definitely um, seems to improve male infertility. So uh, ashwagandha is one of my go-to adaptogens actually, um, and it's one of my favorites. Um, this is Tonkat Ali, uh, is the, the common name, uh, the trade, the brand name, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Latin name is Uricoma longifolia. Um, uh, so this particular botanical has shown in some studies to increase testosterone and improve sexual function. Um, some of the studies uh, were performed with men also exercising and doing some sort of exercising or weightlifting exercises or what have you. And that combination seemed to work very well. So it seems um, uric uricoma longifolia seems to be a very good botanical to use. Um, the dosage there is about 200 milligrams. Uh, a day. Um, so not all exercise can uh, help with testosterone. In fact, those that are long distance um, endurance athletes oftentimes have low testosterone, not high testosterone. So endurance type of events are not good for testosterone, um, but um, um, what they call high intensity uh, training, high intensity training or weightlifting, particularly weightlifting with big muscles like the back and legs. Um, that, uh, that seems to be very helpful in increasing testosterone. So less endurance as, uh, endurance type of activities, you know, be careful with things like, um, uh, like CrossFit uh, because you know, if you do CrossFit, let's just say once or twice a week, fine. But some sometimes people you do this four, five, six times a week, and that will cause too much cortisol to be produced, then um, in the, and which will then inter interfere with testosterone production. Um, vitamin D, I think. We all know that vitamin D is a very important thing. Is even even studies show that it's important for COVID. It's important for many things. So um, uh, it seems to be also important for men who are hypogonadal. So uh, you want to give vitamin D. I I start every patient at 5,000 units a day and work from there. I don't don't prescribe much less than that most of the times. We start at 5,000 a day. Uh, fenugreek, there's two randomized trials. They were small trials, but anyway, there were trials showing some improvement in uh, libido and, and uh, erections and even testosterone and free testosterone. So uh, DHEA seems to, so DHTA, if you remember the slide, DHTA converts into either estradiol or estradione. And then from there, it could, you can, a man can produce either more estrogen 
because it goes right into that pathway or more testosterone. So the metabolic fate of DHEA is unknown. Um, I think that if men have uh, low DHEAS levels, um, so that's what you would test for DHEAS, um, you want to give them about 50 milligrams a day of DHEA. And I think that's a very good thing to do. And it might increase their testosterone level as well. So DHEA is a fine thing. I usually do not prescribe it unless they are, uh, they are low in DHEAS. And, and then I would prescribe it uh, at about 50 milligrams a day. So we said before that erectile dysfunction is the number one symptom that, uh, that a patient would pres present with. Right, so that, that's the first low libido, uh, erectile dysfunction, and, and low energy. Those are the main things they're going to present. So, uh, ED affects many men. 15% um, of men between 40 to 50 years old, and about 45% of men in their 60s, and so on. Um, sometimes ED can be psychogenic problems at home, problems in, at work, et cetera. Uh, some pharmaceuticals can contribute to ED. Uh, beta blockers are very pop, very commonly used and uh, for hypertension uh, that can contribute to uh, to ED. Uh, SSRIs, um, uh, too much use of uh, alcohol, opioids, um, and recreational drugs, type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, all these things are associated with ED, and which uh, which essentially contributes to poor. Uh, poor health uh, of the arteries, uh, which, which leads to poor production of nitric oxide, which leads to ED. So uh, this has a trickle down effect. Um, so I help a lot of men with ED, testosterone and ED. Um, so we, it seems that testosterone has an important role in, in a, uh, just in regulating penile function. Overall, as we learned, uh, all-cause mortality with low testosterone uh, is a, there's, an, there's an association there. Uh, testosterone regulates uh, uh, nitric oxide synthase, which then is involved in the production of nitric oxide, for there to be enough blood to go into the penile area and to for men to get an erection. Um, low testosterone, however, is not always associated with ED. And high testosterone does not always mean there's no ED. So sometimes you see a man high testosterone, they still have ED. Sometimes you see a man with low testosterone, low testosterone, and uh, they don't have erectile dysfunction. So I don't. It's not. Sometimes it it is presented together, and sometimes it's not. Um, this is disclosure. I formulated X Y Vigor, which uh, full script carries, and I find it to be um, all biases aside, very helpful for men with um, with with erectile dysfunction. So X Y Vigor has L citrulline, ashwagandha, pomegranate extract, and resveratrol, which these two things towards the end helps with um, artery, artery integrity and helps with the production of nitric oxide. L citrulline is way more important than arginine to have enough arginine in the body for sexual health and have enough blood flow. And ashwagandha, again, you always want to treat ED and any type of testosterone issues with ashwagandha um, or, or adaptogens. You can include rhodiola into the mix. I just thought that the research were, was more robust with ashwagandha than rhodiola. This formula, as to the best of my knowledge, does not necessarily increase testosterone uh, in the body. It, it wasn't my intent. This formula, it's only and solely to help men with erectile dysfunction. So, um, so it's typically two pills twice a day. And if men have an advanced case of ED, they can use a very low dose of a PD-5 inhibitor like um, Cialis, Viagra, or Levitra, a very low dose where there's no side effects with two pills of, Vi of XY Vigor. And that seems to do the job. Again, I don't have any evidence that this product um, increases testosterone. I've, I've seen uh, men can increase their testosterone level by being active, by being sexually active. So have I seen men increase their testosterone level after taking XY Vigor? Yes, I have. Is it a result of the, is it significant? Probably not, maybe just a couple of 50 points or so. Um, part of my regimen for men to increase their testosterone includes XY Vigor, but a bunch of other things um, like exercise and uh, some of the other botanicals that we we covered, but XY Bigger seems to um, seems to work very well in helping men with sexual function at two pills a day. All right, so I, I could take one or two questions, Kayla, if you if you like, um, and and then the rest. 
through drgeo.com, there's ways of contacting me. And if there's there's a good chance that you may have more questions and, and, and I'm aware of that. Um, you can contact me through my website and I typically uh, answer them uh, as a uh, to, to colleagues um, who are trying to figure these things out as a uh, as a as, you know as a colleague. So, but I'll take one or two, uh, Kayla, if you'd like. Thank you. Very yeah, much. actually, one one just came in um, about that your supplement X Y Vigor. Um, you may have kind of covered it, but would you recommend using this supplement for healthy men without symptoms or diagnosis as a preventative? Um. I, I think most men that I see clinically complain about some sort of sexual issues. Um, uh, so particularly, you know, these are middle-aged to older men. Um, so, you know, I, I take it with no, no issues because of, I think as we age, it's very important to keep healthy arteries and keep our smooth muscles healthy. Um, so resveratrol and pomegranate, I think are very important for that. The other thing is L-citrulline also helps with lowering blood pressure. Um, so one of the things that you want to be careful with is that if a patient naturally has low blood pressure, let's say 100 over 70 or 90 over 60, and that's their normal blood, you know, blood pressure, then something like XY Bigger can actually cause them some dizziness because they may lower it even more. But um, for most of the population, um, it, the opposite is true. Men have uh, high blood pressure, not low blood pressure. So it can be helpful in that end. So I think it's very helpful for anti-aging and for just circulation uh, and certainly circulation in the pelvic area. And there was a question on just the use of ashwagandha. What would be the advised dosage to use? I right. know, I believe you said it's also in, in the supplement. It's um, an XY bigger. And it's formulated, right. but yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The right dosage is anywhere between uh, about 300 milligrams uh, twice a day. So about 600 milligrams okay. a day split up i think best yeah and i'm not sure actually if you mentioned it but does saw palmetto have an effect on testosterone no it does not and so okay. saw palmetto so people think that um it's thought out there that it has a uh, it's very similar to finasteride and dutesteride and it has five alpha reductase abilities some studies show that it has very um weak very weak 5-alpha reductase ability. So uh, there should be no concern about salt palmetto reducing DHT, uh, even if that's the intention. Um, it doesn't serve that purpose too well. So there, there are no issues with salt palmetto and testosterone or DHT. Okay, and a couple questions coming through now on um, what type of lab testing do you use to test Androgens, do you do a dried urine testing or yeah, saliva versus serum? Yeah. Very good question. All right. So I'm an integrative doctor. Sometimes I work with other conventional doctors. In fact, I work most of the times with other conventional doctors. So we need to talk the same language. So I always mm -hmm. use blood as, as a primary mm -hmm. uh, form of testing. As a functional medicine doctor, I use dried urine tests, um, which I I think it's very helpful. I, I, I use, an, I don't have any uh, financial connection with the company. I, I use the, the Dutch test, and I think that's a very good test to measure cortisol and those kinds of metabolites. Um, so I use both. I use blood and I use dried urine tests. Okay. Um, one came in, you mentioned that you see a lot of patients in their 20s and 30s. Is there a more common reason for low T in that age group? The high cortisol. Yeah. Be Very something. good question. Very good question. I I I don't know what the deal is with the, <laughs> the younger population. Uh, I really don't. Uh, um, I don't think they've been studied. Um, so I haven't seen a paper written on, let's say, men under 30 with low T. Uh, my clinical experience is that there tend to be higher cortisol levels. I think they're stressed out of their minds trying to figure things out. I think perhaps the over connection with social media and, and their phones is a problem. Uh, I think mm. they are staying up too late at night and they are not sleeping well, thus causing other problems. I, I think it's all of those things. Um, the way the world works, uh, the uncertainties of the world, uh, uh, getting a job, getting a good job, all these things are affecting. And once they're in their 30s and early 30s, then they start having families and 
uh, a lot of uncertainties that come with that. I think it's just life um, and the way life yeah. is now. It's my it's my it's it's my suspicion. Uh, again, I haven't seen a paper written on that particular population. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, maybe one more. How many? How much time? Maybe we could do one more. And again, um, you said that they can go to is it drgeo.com for yeah, any more? Is and and, and yeah. again, I will. The, I, I do. I have a courtesy with my professional uh, colleagues, so I do tend to uh, answer uh, questions. Uh, Okay, so. yeah. Um, well, one more that came through says or asks, when supplementing testosterone therapy, do you prefer to prescribe estrogen blockers from the start or wait for a symptomatic presentation? So wait, so when, pres by the way, um, just to be clear, I don't, so my method of increasing testosterone or normalizing male, male hormones, I should say, is 100% natural. That includes better sleeping, supplementation, better diet. I don't myself prescribe men with TRT. I do manage many men with TRT that are given by one of my colleagues in urology or an endocrinologist. That said, um, supplementing with um, an aromatase inhibitor is not necessary unless the labs show that there's a the, in, there's too much of an increase or they're symptomatic. So if the labs show, you know, uh, 50, 60 picograms per milliliter of estri estradiol, then I would start. Um, and they're symptomatic, I would definitely use aromatase inhibitors in that situation uh, in men that are using, um, that are undergoing TRT. Hmm. Okay. Uh, maybe one more that's kind of a quick one. I can, uh, there's a lot of questions coming through and uh, this is great, but we do want to be mindful of everyone's time. But there was a question on any other resources that you recommend to further research on treating ED or slash low T. Um, any things that other than that um, amazing book that you got, <laughs> um, the uh, first book ever you. you said, that sounds interesting, but um, anything other than like other books that you've read or, or, you know, resources that have helped you along the way? So, um, you know, um, a, a lot of what I know is just super, as I said in early in my presentation, and extraordinary curiosity about how all these things work and really going to going narrow and deep, if you will. Um, certainly a lot of conferences. I, I think the Integrative Sexual Health book that uh, um, that I co-edited is actually extraordinarily good um, and the best in this, um, in this space. Um, you know, <laughs> writing a book is an interesting process and sometimes I don't want to look at a book after I write it for at least a year because I feel like yeah. it was just so arduous. Then after about a year, I open it up and I start reading it almost as if I had nothing to do with it. And then I'm like, and then I determine, is it good, is it not? Um, that happened with it, with that integrative sexual health book where I was like, I, then I opened it up. I was like, wow, this is, wow, this is good. <laughs> It really I'm good. good yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's a valuable resource for people. Um, if if you, you could go ahead and sign up to my uh, drgeo.com, I do tend to write for lay people, but sometimes uh, I it's so I try to keep it in the middle where um, you know, practitioners can also appreciate what I write. Uh, I do my best to do so, and, I, and again, I, I will. I'm developing online courses for that. So stay in touch with me, and I think that um, I'll be able to provide something useful for people. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. Again, I know it's on the screen, but drgeo.com um, for maybe some more resources and staying in touch. And I will be um, respectful of everyone's time. And I want to thank um, thank all the attendees for taking the time out today. And thank you, Dr. Dr. Geo, for being with us today. Um, I know the presentations oh, are always so um, educational and I know we have a great turnout and people are very excited to hear you speak. So thank you for being with us and we hope we can do more in the future with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, just a quick reminder for those who are still here, we will be sending out a recording of this. Um, so check your emails. And again, you can find it on fullscript.com slash webinars if you want to see um, past webinars with Dr. G as well. So um, that being said, I'll thank everyone again and uh, enjoy the rest of everyone's day. We'll hope to see you soon. <laughs>